here's Asclepius. We know Asclepius. We know his staff that he has a snake. Um, you know, they associated snakes with the underworld because they slither into holes and disappear and are one of those uh, creatures associated with the communication with the people of the afterlife. And so it'd be common to have a snake, see a snake in the sanctuary of the gods of healing, like Asclepius. We'll also talk about Apollo, we'll talk about Bonadea and a number of other deities, Salus, as in salutary, Hygieia, as in hygiene, Fortuna, and so on. So the basic concept is people get ill and people need to get better. And how do you get better? So they obviously have uh, people experiment with what exists in nature, uh, whether it be, you know, herbs or plants, uh, you know, different foods, different concoctions, um, you know, read Pliny's uh, natural histories on different medicinal practices. Some of them are out of control. Uh, very invented, very inventive. Uh, you know, the sweat of a gladiator and so on. But, um, you know, also in the Roman times, we have Galen. Galen, who is uh, a fabulously influential um, physician for people, even in the Renaissance. Uh, he's alive in the reign of um, Septimius Severus. In fact, he goes from his hometown of Pergamon to Rome, to eventually be the physician of Marcus Aurelius and Commodus and so forth. Uh, but, you know, people did recognize in antiquity that various natural springs with minerals had certain healing properties. And we've done a video on San Cassiano, uh, which is an ongoing activation site near Siena. And uh, I did a video on the bronzes that were found uh, offered in, into some of those springs that were basically in mint condition. Here's a person who, ha who has some, um, uh, if you actually look around the backside of him, he, uh, it's been identified as having a, uh, a spinal uh, malformation. And um, so, you know, think about people that are ailing, people that are hurt, people that want relief. So one, you come and feel relief because you're in the medicinal springs and you can still go there today. And then two, you make offerings, you make vows to the deities, and the deities can then uh, respond by healing you, and then you leave a thank offering. So these are the votive offerings that we find oftentimes. Sometimes you find body parts in a lot of the sanctuaries. So just the foot, just the eye, just the whatever it is, uh, the body part, that part, body part that is aching you uh, in many sanctuaries in the Greco-Roman world. And that's that's going to be across the board, you know, from Egypt to Britain, you know, people are uh, in pain and they want relief from that pain. Uh, and the limitations of medicine at the time, right, can only go so far. Tooth aches, you pull out the tooth, right? That's about the most that you can do. Uh, and then you turn to uh, prayer. And one of the, you know, big deities that will uh, be very successful is Apollo and then uh, his son Asclepius. But, you know, these gods have various manifestations. So uh, Apollo can be a vengeful deity. So he, he can bring on the plague. He does that during the, uh, the Trojan War, but they can also give you reprieve. He can end the plague. Uh, and he is you know, a god of culture, god of medicine, god of healing a vengeful deity, and his birthplace is Delos. And basically you see there in the middle of the Cyclades there, it's near Mykonos. Nobody lives there today. It's abandoned basically by the second century. But for a long time, as the acknowledged birthplace of Artemis and Apollo, it becomes one of the quintessential sanctuaries for all of the Greeks. And in fact, when we're talking about the Delian League, everyone's meeting there making offerings to Apollo. That's uh, at the time of the Persian Wars. Um, under Rome, it has a different kind of purpose. This is a place that doesn't have any natural water sources. All right? So it's not like an ideal place to, to build up an industry. But it does become a uh, harbor town and a, a port for trade. And that's Rome trying to supplant uh, the power of roads, for example, as as the key 
place of trade. And in fact, the free, the slave market was so massive there. It was the largest slave market in the Republican times. And they say the, 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 the quote is 10,000 slaves bought, sold, you know, traded in a day. So astronomical numbers for a place. Now, what's the threat to Delos today is the fact that it's basically so low in the water. A recent study, I just read this this week, it said in 50 years, it's going to disappear. Because it's getting so much more infiltration from the salt water and walls are caving in and so on and so forth. And it's pretty much, there's no hope for it unless you build some huge barrier. But I mean, it's not, a, we're not talking about a Venice here. So I don't know who's going to put any resources into uh, to saving the site. So it's it's pretty dramatic. And we'll probably, in our lifetime, definitely hear of many other places that are at risk of destruction and probably will be destroyed uh, before our eyes. Okay. So Apollo, other famous cult place that you can visit, I was just there this past uh, October, is Delphi, where Apollo killed the python, the python that was harassing his mother. That's why she gave birth in, on the island of Delos. So you have the, the Pythia Oracle, the woman there that's passed on from generation to generation with this title. And then you have the belly button of the world, the, world, the Omphalos is here. So they're kind of the center of the universe kind of idea. And it is a spectacular site if you visit it. That's the Temple of Apollo there in the distance. And, um, you know, here's a rendering of it as well. Of all the treasuries from all the various Greek city-states that would uh, have their own banks, essentially, with offerings given to uh, the god who then gave them a favorable uh, response when they asked a particular question favoring their city. So it has some Pythian games. It's kind of like uh, an Olympic series of competitions. And over time into the, into the Hellenistic period, even with the Romans, impressive offerings are being made as thank offerings to the god who uh, you know, would answer your questions. But also it's a place of um, ritual and pilgrimage. And it's a place where you could get healed. Uh, you can tell I'm in Rome. Yeah, okay. All right. So let's turn to Rome. There's a plague in Rome. You appeal to your deities. They don't end the plague, so you go abroad. But already Apollo's in southern Italy because the Greeks are colonizing it in the 8th century. So it's not like you're going all the way to Greece. Although for Asclepius, they will. Uh, so you have a plague in 431 called Apollo the Healer, so Apollo Medicus. And then you get an upgrade to it and give it a new name with a new uh, dedicator. And this is Sosius, who's a friend of Julius Caesar, then an ally of Mark Antony. But by the time he's decorating it, it's got decorations referring to the triumph, not of his in Judea, but to the triumph of Augustus against Illyria. So you have that. In the uh, next to the Theater of Marcellus, there it is on the right, reconstructed in the fascist period. That's the Temple of Apollo Sicianus. And then you have on the Palatine Hill, the Temple of Apollo Palatinus. So this one's vowed to uh, help win a war against Sextus Pompey, who had basically taken over Sicily when Octavian is in charge of the West and Mark Antony is over in the East. You have to get rid of Sexus Pompey to ensure grain is coming from Sicily to Italy. You make a vow to Apollo, but by the time you're building it, well, you've now defeated Mark Antony at Actium. So the decoration, here's an image there from the Palatine Hill associated with that, with that temple. Uh, you know, you're going to change it. You're going to change the, the the decoration and refer now to the Actium victory. So it becomes also Actium Apollo and stuff like that on the Palatine Hill. But again, a god of healing, especially healing needed after the civil wars. Then a little side note, Antonius Musa is this, uh, this physician who um, you know, is going to cure Augustus. He gets really cold. He does basically cold plunges to cure his crazy fever, which can actually work. And, uh, you know, 
Augustus is going to end up comparing him in his lifetime to Asclepius. He's so indebted to this person for saving his life. And we'll pass to Asclepius. So Asclepius is god of healing, a son of Apollo, who has a number of cult you know, sanctuaries in the east, the island of Kos, Pergamon in, uh, in Turkey, and then Epidaurus on mainland Greece. That's the main one is Epidaurus. There's an image of Pergamon. Here's an image of the series of terraces in the sanctuary of Kos. And here I am in Epidaurus. And the greatest theater of the Greek world is Epidaurus. Magnificent setting, religious setting. And I think you will be impressed. So that was an October lovely theater, of course, with great acoustics. And here is the actual Tholos, where you had the ritual associated with uh, communicating directly with the deity. And what you have associated with the Sclepius is under restoration, as you can tell. What you have with the Sclepius is, is a, um, an experience of incubation. So you'd come, you'd sleep, and the god would visit you in your sleep and tell you what to do to get healed. So you're kind of like in dormitories or sleeping there, and the god is visiting you. That's how the procedure works. Now, Asclepius comes to Rome, and he's going to come uh, through via a, a plague. They appeal to Apollo. doesn't work. They appeal to Asclepius. The delegation goes to Epidaurus that we just visited. And they bring back a snake that's uh, manifested, is kind of occupied by the spirit of, uh, of Asclepius. And then when the boat gets close to Rome, it slithers off and onto the Tiber Island, a great place to put your sick patients, a genius place to put your sick patients because they're isolated from everyone else. And the uh, Tiber Island eventually is going to look like a boat. Here's a section that's Republican in date. And we look at some of the decoration of that boat-like setting, of which the uh, island would look like. And there's Asclepius with his staff with a snake. So that's Asclepius Temple on the island. It gets uh, changed out, and it's the Church of Saint Bartholomew on the Tiber Island today. There's Bonadea, another deity of chastity and healing and fertility. On the Aventine Hill, this is the famous place where Claudius tried to dress up as a woman to see what the heck was going on. But it's a rare festival in that women are allowed to get drunk. Women are allowed to make uh, animal offering sacrifices without any men managing them. And it's even with the aristocratic women are there at night. So this is the thing that the, uh, the Senate frowns upon because they don't like women having any kind of independence. But it's one of these untouchable festivities, and it has to deal with healing. So when we think about healing, think about fertility, we can also think back to Fortuna Primogenia, childbirth, and so forth. So you have a lot of other deities associated with healing in that sense. So there's Velatudo, Sociophagea, the Salus, also dealing with health, Febris. Febris is basically getting rid of fevers due to malaria. Feronia, we see her in Largo Argentina Sanctuary. And I'm standing next to the statue of Veovis. So Veovis is simply a, an adolescent form of Jupiter that has attributes of Apollo. So he's oftentimes shown with uh, holding arrows. So he's got some of the attributes of Apollo and Apollo, and he then are also associated with healing. He has two temples, one on the Capitoline Hill where I'm standing by, and the other one was on the Tiber Island, which makes sense because it's by the Temple of Asclepius, and then I've mentioned some of the cults of Fortuna. Funding was provided by the CAAS Mashantonio Award.